Morning, everybody. Are we good? Yeah. Well, a few of you are anyway. Uh, for the rest of you, maybe we'll chat after and see how you're really doing. So if you've got a Bible with you um, or you've got a Bible app or some way to access the Bible, you may want to look up uh, Leviticus 10, which is where we're going to be. Um, in our Bibles this morning. If you don't usually come to church with a Bible, um, I would really encourage you um, to, because we work through God's Word, and it's good sometimes to to actually see it and and look at it, or if you're struggling with knowing which Bible translation to have, come and see us afterwards, and we'd love to to assist you with that. But if you uh, missed last week, or you simply just can't remember, um, that's okay, it's hard to remember one day to the next, but you might need a refresher, but we started um, a brand new sermon series last week called Living a Life of Passionate Pursuit. And last week we explored um, the Gospel of Mark chapter 12, where we thought about what it looked like to live a life of passionate pursuit through the act of devotion to God, where we love him and devote our whole life to him through our heart, our mind, our soul, and our strength. Do you remember that? (laughs) <laughs> do you remember that? Hopefully you do. Well, this week, uh, we are in week two of our Living a Life of Passionate Pursuit, and we're going to be thinking about uh, what it means to passionately pursue the Lord through worship. But before we get to that this morning, I just want you to, and we'll go through these um, screen team at the back one by one, um, but I want you to take a look at some of the pictures that are coming up on the screen, and just before they come up, all you have to do is When you see the picture, I want you to consider what is the most appropriate response to the situation. Okay, you got that? So when you look at the picture, what is the most appropriate response to each of these circumstances? So first one, okay? So if you were invited to meet the the royal family and you went into a room of the royal family, what would be the, the right response, the most appropriate thing to do? Yes, or... If it was the king or whatever, bye, yeah. Okay, I'm not very good at this next one, but what is the most appropriate response if you were to go into a place like this? (laughs) What would you have to do? Yeah, yeah, that's why I don't go. Okay, then what about this one? All right, when we think about the Lord and the crown and the king, what, what is the right response? Yeah. Worship, um, anything else? Any other words? Reverence and fear, what we've been hearing about this morning. You see, I didn't actually really have to tell you what you had to do in any of those situations because you already knew the answer to that. Because in every single aspect of our lives, whether we are consciously aware of it or not, but there are historical traditions, there are cultural etiquettes, there is symbolism, and there are rituals that shape how we approach different situations and circumstances. And one of the areas where this influence is particularly evident is in worship. And I know that a room filled of people and people who know and and love the Lord, you bring to the table your preconceived ideas and your own biases of what it means to worship God. And the reality is we think like that and we come with our differences because each of us come from different backgrounds. Some of us have even had a different church experience before we've come here. And we've had different experiences in our life that, that shape how we approach worship. Isn't that right? However, if you genuinely want to live a life of passionate pursuit for God, we must recognize that our approach to how we worship is hugely significant. You see, our engagement with worship relates to our devotion to our Heavenly Father. And the good news is that God has given us plenty in his word to help us understand what is actually expected of us as the people of God who worship a holy God. Now, I'm not sure if you've ever thought about worship in this way or or considered worship from this perspective, but if there is a, a right way to worship the Lord, which I believe there is, okay, if there is a right way to worship the Lord, then that must mean there is a, a not an unacceptable way to worship the Lord. So if there is a right way to worship the Lord, there must be an unacceptable way to worship the Lord. 
And as I was reflecting on that idea and how to encourage us to pursue a life of passionate pursuit through worship, I was drawn to what may appear as a very bizarre passage from the book of Leviticus. And chapter 10 especially is what we're going to be looking at this morning. And like I say, you might be thinking, even as you cast your eye over it, cheapers, um, that is an interesting passage to be looking at. But bear with me, people, because hopefully this morning you're going to see God's heart for his people who are called to worship him and bring him glory and honor and praise. Because after all, the reality is, if you love and know and follow the Lord Jesus Christ, we bear the responsibility as Christians to honor God with our worship in the right way. Okay? Now, I don't know about you, but I am not all that good with reading instructions. My personality type is just, see it, do it, see it, do it, okay? But then I get really frustrated at times when I see and can't do it, okay? And then I have to go back to the instructions in the first place to work out how to do it because I realize that I can't do it because I've rushed into it thinking I know how to do this. And you know what the lesson is for me? Should have started with the instructions in the first place. Anybody ever experienced that? So frustrating, so frustrating. Sometimes we think that the instructions that are given to us are more of a barrier than they are an aid, but instructions are a good thing. And they are a helpful guide. They are a tool that um, will enable us to, to do what we need to do. And the principle of instructions is also illustrated for us in the book of Leviticus where the Lord gives to his people instructions. He gives to them guidelines about how to live and, and how to worship and how not to do that and how to live in harmony with one another. It's all in here. Don't just take my word for it. Take the Lord's actual word for it. If you've never read uh, the book of Leviticus, um, spoiler alert, the premise of the, the book is about the importance of how you approach a holy God. How do you come into worship and reverence with respect that he deserves? And not only was it for the people of that day, but it is also for you and I today. Now, a little bit of uh, background, what's going on, going on here. At this particular moment in history, it was a very pivotal moment. The Israelites have arrived at, at what was called the foot of Mount Sinai where the tabernacle had been completed. Now, you might be asking, what is the tabernacle? Well, the tabernacle can be described in Scripture as the tent of meeting. And basically, what had happened in Exodus was the Lord had given to the Israelites instructions of how to create this tent of meeting. If you have a spare time after church today and you want to go and figure out the exact, precise, intimate details of how to build a tabernacle, then go to the book of of Exodus. So they've got all these instructions in Exodus. By the time they get to Leviticus, this tabernacle has been constructed. And the whole point of this tent of meeting, this tabernacle, was to facilitate worship with the Israelites and to serve as a sacred space for the Lord to come and dwell amongst his people. The tabernacle was also designed to be mobile so that they could pack it up and move it as the Israelites journeyed through the wilderness. But this wasn't just some sort of tent that you would take, like you would go to Le Bourne's and you would just fire it up and hope for the best or struggle to fire it up and hope for the best. But this tabernacle, this tent of meeting was so important that there were very, very intimate instructions about how it was to be orchestrated inside. There was an order that had to be adhered to if you were to approach this tent of meeting. Much like when you go to, a, let's say, like a, an art museum or a, a place about history. You know, when you get there, there's all these signs, do not touch this, do not touch that. And then in the art gallery, sometimes there's very sacred pieces of, of artwork that there's actually a barrier that you cannot cross because they don't want you to touch the most valuable item. Well, in a similar way, the tabernacle had a carefully designed layout and everybody knew where they could go and where they couldn't go. And if you take a look at the tabernacle on the screen, 
This is kind of more of a, a basic um, picture of, of what it looked like, but I was just trying to make it as simple as possible because there are so many details you could get overwhelmed. But basically, as you can see there, um, it's split up into three sections. You have the outer court, the holy place, and the most holy place. Now, the outer court was the place where it was accessible to everybody, where the community could come along and, and they could gather together to present their offerings and sacrifices. And then as you move on into the, the holy place, only the priests could come here. Only they were allowed to enter this section. And this section was reserved for, for really important sacred duties at that time. And they would attend to what was called like a, a golden lampstand and they would go in there and they would offer up incense and all those kinds of things. But then one more step further is the most holy place, the holy of holies. This is where, where God's presence dwelt, right in the center of the most holy place. It was sacred. And only, only the high priest could enter into this place once a year. So here's what you need to know about the tabernacle and about God's holiness. The sections in the tabernacle remind us that worship is serious, very, very serious. In fact, not only was worship serious, it was dangerous. You see, if you entered into any one of these zones um, without authorization, without permission, without the right preparation, without cleansing, God's presence could break out in judgment. So it was pretty serious. And I'll share some more about the seriousness of that kind of worship in a moment or two. But, but hopefully you're seeing that this tabernacle wasn't just some sort of physical structure of a tent. It was a demonstration of, of God's desire to dwell and be present amongst his people. And folks, let's remember, he didn't have to do this. The Lord did not have to do this. And actually, I believe, and hopefully you do, that the tabernacle is actually um, a demonstration of God's grace. Because by, by doing this and allowing his people to come and worship him, he was saying that despite your sin and your rebellion, my heart is still that you would have a way to come and fellowship and seek forgiveness from a holy God. I don't know about you, but I think that's pretty gracious. Let's look at the screens again. And just before those pictures go up, this time, what I want you to do is to look at the screen and I want you to tell me what is needed in order for these things to work. All right, I'm really pushing your brains this morning here. Here we go. So, game of rugby. What, what do you need in order for the game of rugby to work well? Come on. Yes, thank you. Referee, referee. Decent players would be good as well. All right. What, yes, you're right, Joan. What about this next one? What do you, what do you need in order for... Yes, yes, well done. Patience. Somebody say patience. No, teacher. All right, what about this? Very easy. What do you need in order for this to work well? A driver, yes, yes. And what do you need in order for this to sound beautiful? Yes, musicians, Mount Mary musicians, yes. In order for even the most simple things in life to run and function effectively, the reality is you need individuals to fulfill specific roles. Isn't that right? And it was no different in the time of the Israelites at their time in history. They needed dedicated people to facilitate all that was happening at that time. The Lord wanted people to fill specific roles to do what he had commanded. So if you've got your Bibles open, you might want to flick back to Leviticus 8, right? And what we see happening in Leviticus 8 is Moses is being commanded to bring Aaron and his two sons, Nadab and Abihu, for ordination as priests. Okay, we got that? Aaron is to bring his two sons, Nadab and Abihu, Abihu, sorry, for ordination as priests. Why were they coming for ordination? Well, the hope was that these two sons would fulfill the specific roles within the priesthood, a bit like I do. 
A bit like ordained ministers do. Within the priesthood, they've been ordained to fulfill specific roles. They were to assist with the worship and the sacrificial system that God had orchestrated. Now, fast forward to Leviticus 9. Moses and Aaron have set an example to everyone around them about how it looked to honor and love the Lord in the way that the Lord commanded. In fact, if you have your Bibles open, chapter 9, 23, it says this about them on the screen. And Moses and Aaron went into the tent of meeting, and when they came out, blessed the people, and the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. And fire came out from the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the pieces of fat on the altar. And when all the people saw it, they shouted and fell on their faces. Just imagine this moment, right? It's a beautiful display of the Lord's presence. He was dwelling in the midst of his people. The people were doing what the Lord had commanded. The Lord is gazing upon their worship. The Lord is delighted with their worship. He is actually welcoming their heartfelt offerings and sacrifices. The people are recognizing the holiness of the Lord. The holiness comes upon the people. It is actually so strong that they fall down in worship and revere the Lord. It is good. But over the page, Leviticus 10, you're going to see a very different story to what's happening in Leviticus 9. Listen to this. Sounds bizarre. Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, that's a tricky name to say, took their censers, put fire in them and added incense. And they offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, contrary to his command. So fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them. And they died before the Lord. Moses then said to Aaron, this is what the Lord spoke of when he said, among those who approach me, I will be proved holy. In the sight of all the people, I will be honored. And Aaron remained silent. It's just bonkers. Like that is hard to take in. Nadab and Abihu die. The Lord consumes them. They're dead. What, What did they do? that was so wrong that, that it warranted that the Lord would outrightly consume them? Well, they did something the Lord commanded them not to do. They offered something that was unauthorized. In fact, the word unauthorized can be translated to mean profane, right? And that word profane means irreverent and disrespectful or it can be translated to mean strange fire. So they have unauthorized before the Lord something they weren't commanded to do. It was profane, it was irreverent, it was disrespectful, it brought no glory to the Lord, and it was considered strange fire. Now, we aren't exactly sure what was the strange, irreverent, unauthorized fire that they offered. There have been many kind of thoughts around it, but we aren't... exactly sure, but, but it was serious nonetheless. Because in contrast, right, Aaron, the father, was obedient to what the Lord commanded, and as a result, God was pleased and accepted and consumed the sacrifice. But what his sons did, the Lord was not happy about, and instead of consuming their sacrifice, the Lord consumed them. Now, you might wonder, Is that not just a little bit harsh from the Lord? Like, is that not a step too far? However, it's important to recognize a couple of things here. Firstly, Aaron's sons took what was meant for the Lord and used it to serve their own purposes. That's how serious it was. They took what was meant for the Lord and they used it to glorify self. Scripture's clear, we must and we cannot do that as followers of Jesus. 
The Lord is holy and deserves our proper worship. Actually, Dave, you, 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 I didn't know you were going to read this out, but you read this out as our call to worship this, at the start. Isaiah 6, Isaiah says this, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And the repetition of the word is purposeful in its placement because it emphasizes just how supremely holy, holy, holy the Lord really is. His holiness is indescribable. We, folks, worship a supremely holy, holy, holy God. And the Lord's holiness is is beautiful and and it's powerful, but it's also incredibly dangerous as we've just read. And if we want to understand it better, perhaps this this might help. And I know a lot of people have used the sun um, to kind of illustrate this point, but We've been enjoying the sun this past week and it's been beautiful and some of you are enjoying it so much now that it's actually making your eyes close, right? But keep them open, keep them open. The Lord's stuff is good. You need to hear the Lord's stuff, right? You need to hear the Lord's word. It's good, it's good, it's good, I promise. But the sun we've been enjoying this week has been beautiful. It's provided us with both light and warmth and without it, nothing would thrive, thrive, right? The Lord has created it all. However, However, if you were to get far too close to the sun, and I mean really, really close, the same light that brings us joy and warmth would actually incinerate you. It would kill you if you were to get that close to the sun. Not because the sun in and of itself is bad, because it's powerful. Do you see that? It is not bad, it's powerful. It is good, but if you get far, far too close to it, it would incinerate you. And just as the sun is powerful, yet overwhelmingly powerful, God's holiness is both a a source of of encouragement and hope and comfort, and also it's a reminder of our limitations because he is a holy God. And so to navigate this divine relationship between the Lord and us as humans The people were provided with a way to do that because he was so holy. And he did it with this system of sacrifices and rituals. And these practices offered a way to approach a God reverently and to understand his immense power. Now this framework was not to be a barrier, it was actually to be a place of access. And we know, folks, right, we're not Old Testament people, we're New Testament Christians, right? And so we know that there is access to the the Father because of what Jesus has done on the cross for for, for dying for our sins, all right? We know that access has been granted. But in light of this, I think we as small church, local church, but the church at large need to recapture again a biblical understanding of God's holiness where we come to him in reverence and fear. But you know what, folks? Holiness is a word in our culture that people don't like because it evokes um, words like judgment or restriction or that's boring or that, that's that's not tangible. But folks, holiness in the Lord and understanding this holiness is not about rigid rules or unattainable perfection. When we embrace the concept of the Lord's holiness, we realize actually it's a pathway to a deeper intimacy with him that you are being invited to. And so all that we've been reflecting on this morning serves as a reminder to us, yes, that that worship to God is wonderful and beautiful, but it's also serious. It's a serious thing. And we need to be people who recognize that so that as we come to him and worship, we do so in reverence and fear in the right way. And by that, I mean we come to the Lord with respect. And we honor and approach him recognizing in the words that we were laying in this morning that he is indeed a good, good father. In today's fast-paced and often distracted world, this concept of reverence often seems diminished or even forgotten about by some people. And this loss 
is significant because a deep sense of awe and respect for God is foundational for us when it comes to authentic worship. You want a healthy spiritual life of worship with the Lord, then you need to have a deep sense of awe and respect for the Savior, for Christ. And whilst we recognize that we're not living under the same law, nor do we need to visit a tabernacle, nor do we need to present um, animals or incense um, for offerings or sacrifices. We don't need to do that. Yet, it is equally true that worship is no less weighty today to the Lord than it was in the time of the Israelites. Worship hasn't changed. The God we worship is unchanged in his holiness and his majesty and therefore deserves our respect, our awe, and our reverence. And he is the one, not Church of Ireland, not Presbyterian, not Baptist, not Elam, not non-denominational, not anyone determines how we worship the Lord, but him in his word. He decides how we come to him. And our worship to the one we know about and hear should reflect the gravity of his presence. You know, in the Gospel of John 4, it says this on the screen, but the hour is coming and is actually now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. Those who desire to worship the Lord passionately will worship him in spirit and in truth. However, the hard reality and yet the sad reality at times is we aren't worshiping in either spirit or truth. There are many who profess the Lord with their lips, but their heart is far from him. Like Aaron's sons, there are many today who are lighting up strange and profane fires before the Lord that bring zero glory to the Father. They're taking what was meant for good and they're adding their own things to it to glorify self. And you know what, folks? We see that time and time again, especially online. It would put your head away. Where, where individuals are, are spreading a counterfeit gospel to people. We even see some people engaged in, in spiritual activities that seek and seem to the outsider that they're glorifying the Lord, but actually they're using it as a tool to glorify themselves. And folks, if you want to know what the essence of profane worship is, here it is. It may appear that you love the Lord, yet your day-to-day -day actions and your lifestyle suggest that you have a greater love and affection for the world. That is profane worship. Where you say you love the Lord and it may appear that you do, but actually your day-to-day -day actions and your lifestyle suggest that you have a greater love for the world. Is that you? Is that me? You can't serve two masters. And so what I want to ask you is a personal question for you to think about, and I have been thinking about this in my own life this week, and I will continue to this week. Are there any strange fires in your life right now that you have been offering to the Lord, and you know that they're simply bringing no glory to him? Are you doing anything in your life that you know is profane to the Lord? There's no respect or reverence for him you see, every single one of us who claims to be a follower of Jesus and claims to love the Lord our God with all of our heart and our mind and our soul, we should take a, a really hard, honest look at who we worship, why we worship, and how we worship. And I say this in love, um, because I do love you. But just so as you know, and we are all on the same page, Worship is not about you. Okay? <laughs> worship is not about you. Worship is about the Lord. It always has been 
and it always will be. It is not about you. And while lifting our voices in praise through song is good and right and biblical, and we should do that all of the time, the essence of what it means to worship extends beyond songs. When the Lord says, come to me and worship me, the Lord is saying, I am inviting you into a way that puts God at the very center of your life. And we will struggle to have God at the center of our lives if we seek to put ourselves at the center of our own life. We're going to struggle to have the Lord there if we are there. And some of us might think the world actually revolves around us, but but newsflash, it doesn't. It doesn't because the Lord is the one who should have our all. And that is why we need to identify and actually go as far as purging out of us profane and strange fires that do not bring any glory to the Lord. Those distractions, those, those habits, those, those attitudes, those relationships, those whatever, whatever, whatever hinder a more passionate pursuit of the Lord because only then when we purge them out, when we ask the Holy Spirit to come and reveal and convict us of what those are, can we walk more consistently in our relationship with the Lord, giving him the worship that he deserves 